Well, let's take a look now at the input and output resistances for the common emitter amplifier. Input, output resistance. And the, uh, the input resistance, again, we're calculating these resistances. We've, we've just built an AC amplifier. And so when we're calculating input and output resistances, we're looking at the AC equivalent circuit um, or gain for that matter. So when I'm calculating my input resistance, what I'm looking when I see the circuit is um, I see CC1, I'm going to see it as a short for my AC equivalent circuit. And then I see R1 connected to an AC ground because it's connected to VCC. So what I what I see when I look at um, R in there is, let's see what I can write it maybe here. Uh, I'm looking at a short for CC1 and then I see R1 connected to ground in parallel with R2 connected to ground for this equivalent purposes in parallel with the input resistance looking into the base of the transistor, which we labeled RIB in our circuit. Now we have defined IR RIB as being beta times RE, but notice that in, uh, in that we ignored little RE, and so we can sort of add that into our reflection rule scenario up here. So this will be beta times little RE plus RE, or the series combination of the two. So it's beta times the overall resistance connected to the emitter. Uh, and so when I'm looking at the input resistance, which is the resistance looking into that circuit, it's going to be equal to the parallel combination of R1, R2, and RIB. So the parallel combination of R1, R2, and beta times little RE plus big RE. I can substitute my values. R1 is 220K. R2 is 20K. I'm going to skip the units just to make things a little bit more um, condensed. So 220K in parallel with 20K, in parallel with 100 uh, times little re, we just calculated to be 50 plus um, capital R is 2K. So we can see we have 220K in parallel with 20K in parallel with something in the order of 200K. Uh, the parallel combination of the three is going to be approximately equal to R2 since R2 is much smaller uh, than the other two resistances. And so we can approximate this as 20 kilo ohms, or we can say R in is approximately equal to R2. Here, let's take a look at the output resistance. And the output resistance, um, just as the input resistance was the resistance looking into the circuit, so we're looking from here, this is R in. Uh, the output resistance will be the resistance seen when you're looking uh, from the output of the circuit towards the circuit, so it will be the resistance looking in there or out. And again, I can see, you know, a CC2 capacitor, which I'm going to approximate as a short circuit for my AC equivalent circuit. And then I see RC connected to um, a, an AC ground, because it's a DC source VCC. And then I'm looking into the collector of my transistor. And if you remember the hybrid Pi model, when I look into the collector of the transistor, I see an ideal current source in parallel with an output resistance, little RO. Um, an ideal current source will have an output resistance of infinity, so it'll be like an open circuit. And so basically what I'm left with is, oh, change the color. What I am left with is my um, R out looking into the V out terminal. It's a short and then RC connected to an AC ground and little RO. And so it will be RC in parallel with little arrow. And little arrow uh, is one of those AC parameters that is, uh, whose value is dependent on the uh, DC um, bias point. And it's equal to the early voltage divided by the collector current. 
In this case, the early voltage is 100 volts. The collector current is 0.5 milliamps. And so that's 200 kilo ohms. So when I enter those values, I have 20 kilo ohms in parallel with 200K, which is approximately 20K. And so in this case, R out is approximately equal to the collector resistor. And input and output resistances are going to become important as we use our amplifier and we connect it to other things in our circuit, other stages, um, a load, etc. It's going to allow us to find out uh, the loading factors between stages and things like that. So it tells us how our amplifier interacts uh, with other stages that we connect to it. Thank you. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention about this common emitter amplifier uh, before we, we move on to other things uh, is the output voltage swing. Uh, that's going to be an important uh, parameter, an important characteristic for our amplifier because we're trying to use it as a voltage amplifier and um, the bigger or the larger the uh, voltage swing that we have, uh, the larger the ampli amplification factor that we can have um, before the amplifier behaves non-linearly. Uh, again, for a linear amplifier, we want the output to be um, an amplified version of the input. Uh, and so it should have the same shape as the input. Uh, if we run into, you know, cutoff or saturation, we're going to start seeing clipping effects in our output signal, which is an undesirable nonlinear effect. Uh, and so we typically will want to calculate what is our maximum output voltage swing. trying to fit it all nicely in one page. Um, now we have that as um, the output voltage, you know, it may increase or decrease, so it may swing in the positive direction or in the negative direction. If it's swinging in the positive direction, meaning V out increases, and that's due to an increase uh, or a decrease, excuse me, in IC, so if S, IC decreases, Um, so V out can increase uh, up, up, to, up to the point where um, VCC, where it reaches VCC, basically. And at that point, that will mean that there is zero voltage drop across RC, which means zero current flowing through RC. And if there is zero current flowing through the transistor, then the transistor is in cutoff. So that provides our upper limit uh, for the voltage. So when V out reaches VCC, that means IC is equal to zero, and therefore the transistor, I'm going to label it as Q1, Q1 is in cutoff. And um, complementary, if uh, the output voltage decreases or it swings in the negative direction, that's because I see it's increasing. And uh, the farthest down that we can go, uh, we need to keep into consideration the following. For one thing, we need one volt drop across RE. That's how, our, uh, how we're setting our DC bias point. To have VE set to one volt, so we cannot go lower than one volt. Uh, but then we also need to have at least 0.3 volts across the um, collector to emitter terminals in the transistor to keep the transistor out of saturation. And so when V out is equal to um, 1 volt, which is VE, plus the 0.3 volts VCE that will keep the transistor out of saturation, in this case that's 1.3 volts, then that means that um, Q1 is on the verge of saturation. And so basically, you know, these limits between cutoff and saturation dictate how how far our voltage swing can go. Our maximum output voltage is going to be VCC before the transistor cuts off um, or close to. Our minimum V out is going to be around 1.3 volts. And our nominal uh, or quiescent point um, V out, V out, we can call it V out sub Q, 
was actually 10 volts. So we can see that uh, on the positive side, we have um, all the way from 10 volts to 20 volts, that is VCC. So we have a signal swing of 10 volts. And on the negative side, we can go from 10 volts, that is the, uh, the DC point, uh, the DC Q point value, all the way to 1.3 volts. And so we only have 8.7 volts of signal swing. Um, normally, when we're talking about, if we're just describing the amplifier in general and talking about its signal swing, we will go by uh, the worst case scenario. So in this case, we could say the amplifier has a signal swing of 8.7 volts. But again, it's slightly um, smaller in the negative direction in this case than it is in the positive direction.